I always say that an agency only has three things to sell. Processes, programs, and people. Processes are easily commoditized. Programs everybody has access to. Building your own proprietary program generally doesn't work out. Very few people can do it. The real USP for an agency, and then by extension for many businesses, is people. So critically important. I just love Parcells. He says one of the biggest things when players come back to him 10 years after their playing career is when he said, I think you're better than you think you are. And they say, that motivated me more than anything else. And they thank him for that. I think as a manager, that's a pretty powerful statement. If you think like you're lying to your people and saying that, you probably have the wrong person on the bus. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns. This is the show where we share cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales to acquire more customers for your business so you can achieve your vision. And today, Kasim, we're going to do a little bit of a departure no tips and tricks and you know funny funny business here on traffic it's all about getting shit done and some managerial tactics i think that the doers out there the people that are getting it done right now are maybe having a hard time and are like well i'm doing all these things that look like they're the right things to do to scale and grow my business on the digital marketing side but maybe I'm not getting those results. And maybe it's because my people are perhaps underperforming. So today we're going to be talking about how to assist in that. Because at the end of the day here, isn't digital marketing a human endeavor? I mean, the robots have not. <laughs> it is right now, Ralph, but robots, time will tell. <laughs> the robots have not taken over quite yet. They are coming. Yeah, I'm right now, <laughs> you still need people to do this stuff. And so we're going to be talking about people tactics here today. So how's that strike you? You ready for a conversation around that? I'm excited, man. I uh, This is my favorite topic or one of them. I always say that an agency only has three things to sell. Uh, processes, programs, and people. Processes are easily commoditizable. Programs everybody has access to. Building your own proprietary program generally doesn't work out. Very few people can do it. The real... USP for an agency, and then by extension for many businesses, it's people. Yeah, uh, so critically important and and overlooked. Everybody treats people like they're just you know cogs to be plugged into the machine. When in reality, that's uh, that's all we've got. Yeah, I would submit that it's not people; it's the right people, because people is is important. People are important, but. As you grow as an organization, the people that got you from zero to a million might not be the same people that can get you from a million to 10 million and 10 yeah, million to 100 right. million. And, you know, one of the things that and we've talked about this in previous shows is that I've done a lot of our initial discovery calls over the summertime. And one of the big frustrations that that businesses have when they come to us sometimes isn't necessarily a traffic question. It's a lot of times it's the staff themselves are just now overmatched because they can't get to that next stage of growth. Like, mm. uh, and they're frustrated. And I know part of the solution is obviously is helping them through utilization of an agency, which is fine. I'm not saying like that's your solution all the time, but maybe it's your internal team that you need to reevaluate a bit. And if we're, Talking not we're not necessarily talking to the people that are the frontline workers here in today's show. We're talking to, you know, the VPs of marketing, the directors of marketing. Maybe you're running your own organization. You know, I have a call later on today with a CEO of a very successful organization that he is running right into this. And it's the people that are the problem right now. And it might be because he has the wrong people on board to execute on his vision and to achieve his vision. And there is uh, an undercurrent through what we're going to talk about here today is having the right people on board. Yes, people are your most important asset and it's an overused, it's a cliche phrase, but the right people are so much more important now because this stuff isn't getting any easier. And even if you well, do- Well, not just that, it's, it's it's two pronged, right? So like things aren't getting easier, they're getting more difficult, yes. But also the tools that we're using are- massive leverage. And yeah. so the right employee takes these, especially the AI driven tools, but all of these tools that we've, we've been given access to and turns themselves into 
hundreds of times the value. But the wrong employee. Good point. The mistake they make, it's Good no point. longer just one mistake. They're now leveraging and amplifying their own mistakes. Right. And so a, a, a bad employee hurts you more than a bad employee used to hurt you because they hurt you on an amplified scale. Yeah. It, that, that's an excellent point. And I think, I mean, we say on the show, yes, stuff is getting harder. Uh, you know, I don't think anything in life is going to get easier as more and more people start doing it. And, and I, I, I do think that with AI and all the automations that we now are on the brink of really being able to explode our productivity, it's going to magnify the potential inadequacies of your staff. And if you've got a mediocre media buyer, it might make them a good media buyer, or it might just magnify their mediocrity. Like mm. there's two ways in which to look at that. So like when I look at AI and I look at all the things that are coming on down the line is that if you don't at least control a part of the AI with some high level thinking, then the AI is just going to do whatever it's going to do without your input. And so you have to have input to be able to control it to a certain degree. And I'm not saying completely control it, but at least from a strategy standpoint, be able to understand, okay, this is a good result or this is a bad result. So AI can magnify you know, the, the inadequacies of your staff, but it can also, on the flip side, it can make a great media buyer an exceptional media buyer if it's used in the right way. So it can, it's a double-edged sword here, but at the heart of all of this and the article that we're going to be referring to here, we'll leave links in the show notes, is all about like getting the right people uh, on, on board. And there's three steps that we're going to go through here today to figure out whether or not maybe you have the right folks and the tactics that we use here. Um, and I've certainly espoused through tier 11. Uh, we've talked about this sort of before we hit record here today, certainly resonate with you. And I see a lot of really great managers and great leaders doing these three things. And that's what we're going to discuss here today uh, and relate it back to digital marketing, relate it back to scaling and growing your business and ultimately achieving your vision. So that is the subject of today. Uh, the name of the article is the tough work of turning around a team from Harvard Business Review. And we're going to dissect that and go into it in very great detail. So before we get into that, do you have a nugget for the perpetual? Oh my goodness, shopping? I'm on the spot. I wasn't ready for oh this. God. Yes, oh my I God. Did. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, no pressure. So uh, this was um, given to me by my buddy, Matthias, who's maybe one of the smartest people in the world. Um, he's using a, a software application called Grist, G-R-I-S-T, Grist. Grist reminds me a lot of Airtable. Um, but what I'd love to do is encourage, especially leadership. If you're C-level, director level, it's really important that you have systems for your decision making. Uh, it's critically important that you have systems for your decision making. As a matter of fact, there's one of my favorite quotes of all time, Ralph Ray Burns, if you don't mind, I'm going to pull it up here. It's uh, Rene Descartes, who's ostensibly the father of uh, Western philosophy. And he says, each problem that I solved became a rule, which served afterwards to solve other problems. And what's nice about things like Grist or even Airtable, I like Grist more than Airtable because it has no limitation in the automation. Airtable people, shame on you for the automations cap. It's insanity to me. You can't even buy additional automation drop. It pisses me off. But with an application like this, what you can start to do is all of the things that you do on a regular basis, you can begin to automate them according to logic. Um, and it's completely customizable. You're, you're effectively coding without having to code. It's maybe my new favorite no-code software. Hmm. So if you're in a leadership position, don't worry about not being able to code because it's not about coding, it's about logic. If this happens, then do this thing. And just go play with it, and you'll start to see the amount of leadership tasks you can automate simply. Hmm. And I think it's a phenomenal little tool. I'm not an affiliate at all. I should be. Um, but that's my nugget for today is go check out Grist and, and get really good at process management. If you're in a leadership role, you have to be really good at process management. And the way to do that is to map out your processes. And these little software applications are great, great places to start. 
have you used it yourself or do you have people on staff that have used it? Like, how did you find out about Dude, it? Dude, my whole agency is built on Airtable. So Solution right. Data is built on Airtable from the ground up, yep. which my Airtable implementation is badass. Someday we can go over that if anybody wants to, if that would be a good good episode. Um, Grist be. is like Airtable without the limitations that I, I hate about Airtable. And, and that's the other thing that's really interesting is, you know, you cannot source your pushups. And so I'm really big on delegation per the conversation we're going to have today, which is having the right people in the right seats. But if you don't know that a process is delegatable, you can't delegate it. And so you have to know enough about process management to know what to delegate, how to delegate, how to overview, how, you know, what the oversight looks like. So there is an element of you have to get in the weeds here a little bit. Hmm. And th that's what I, that's what I think everybody should go, go play with something like this you know, it's, it's really worth the time spent because now you're like, oh my goodness, I can just make somebody else. And now I have that. I've got Julianne, who's uh, the head of our uh, automations team. She's freaking brilliant. Um, she's really the mind behind our Airtable. But if I didn't know how Airtable worked, I never would have known to say, hey, Julianne, can you please go do this thing? Uh, I actually think that uh, doing a show, like depending on how uh, we really value everyone's feedback here. I mean, the, today's show is not about media buying and digital marketing, but it actually is. And we're going to relate it back to that. And I think you actually talking through how you guys utilize that in a separate show with some screen captures might actually be really super uh, valuable for folks. So, but uh, yeah, definitely check it out. So we'll leave links in the show notes. It is Grist, G-R-I-S-T. Yeah, it's getgrist.com. Getgrist.com. We will leave links in the show notes for that and make sure that you do check us out over on our YouTube channel. It's perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. Today's conversation, uh, the tough work of turning around a team in three steps. We're going to be getting into that right after this quick break. All right, so we are back. We are talking about performance. Uh, and we said in the intro here that a lot of the things that we discuss here on this show are, in the end, done by humans. Now, AI, and we talked about this a lot in our last show, Advantage Plus Shopping and Google Performance Max, there is an element of letting the algorithm do the work. But still, at the at the end of the day, I'm not really a big fan of that expression, but I seem to say it a let lot. Let the algorithm do the work. Yeah, at the end of the day, let the algorithm mm. do the work. Uh, at the you know what we're this is a human endeavor, and you as a business or whether you're an agency, whether you're you know a CMO, a director of marketing, a COO that's listening to this, or even somebody who's a frontline worker, this is really really important stuff because digital marketing and getting results and helping businesses to achieve their vision through new customer acquisition, which is what this show is all about, and traffic and how it all blends together, is a human endeavor, like we mentioned. And the article that I send to my team, and I actually have it in one of my favorite apps. This is maybe another hack, but it's one that I find not many people use. It's called Instapaper. And what it is, is you can take an article, a URL, and you, you, in essence, share it to your Instapaper app on your phone, and then it'll read the article to you. So it's like mm. getting a, a, and then you can do it at 1.2 speed, 1.5 speed, whatever it happens to be. So what's the voice sound like though? Is it that annoying robot voice? And I'm going to have to listen to the whole thing just like this. You can choose the voice, which is kind of cool. Really? So I, I always use- Could I have an Englishman? I always use an Australian female. I don't know why. Oh, okay. It's just, you know, it's my favorite voice. Uh, props to Angela Ponsford on staff, who is our, our Australian female I'm going to say, you're staff. a Margot Robbie fan, aren't you, Ralph? <laughs> uh, well, it's just, uh, it's like it's the best voice for me anyway. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Even though my wife says that men tend to tune out female voices, like it's uh, classical music. You ever heard that expression? I was raised by a single mom, dude. I snap to attention right out the gate. I'm like, <laughs> I'm good. about to get hit. It's good. And I need to, yeah. I find offense with that. But anyway, she says that every now and then. Uh, so anyway, so the article is the tough work of turning around a team, which we're going to be going through here. It's uh, from Harvard Business Review. So if you're a leader, that well, this is one of the things that I get every day. And I read HBR. Either I get it through like the Artifact app, which we've talked about before, or I like upload articles into Instapaper and then listen to them. So there's a couple of different ways to consume this content. But some of the best, uh, I think, leadership and management articles, especially as you're in a, you're scaling and growing, this is like getting an MBA into your inbox, I find. Very, very valuable. Mm-hmm. So this is one of my favorite articles from way back in 2000, when, and you uh, rightly uh, pointed out that... Uh, when this article was written, Bill Parcells, who is a Super Bowl winning coach, won two Super Bowls with uh, the New York Giants, also turned around a number of different teams, New England, my New England Patriots. Uh, actually, after I was a, uh, well, the very bad 80s and 90s Patriots. And then Parcells took over and sort of took a different direction. And then they won, you know, six Super Bowls, obviously. Uh, the point is, is he writes the article right before one of his first failures when he took over as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. But I think the principles still apply here. Well, whole, it was an uphill battle. It was an uphill <laughs> battle. He had Tony yeah. Romo as his quarterback. So, I mean, go figure. Or maybe it was Jason Garrett at that point in time. But uh, the whole article is about if you have a team right now that is not performing to expectations – or in his case, it's an extreme case of how to turn around uh, in the case of like the New York Giants. They only won three games in his first season. Like, how did he turn that around? And I find this sort of stuff fascinating. Like, what kind of psychology is used in order to turn around at that point, like a 3-13 and 13 team into a Super Bowl contender literally within a year or two? And he ended up winning two Super Bowls. With the New York Giants, uh, big props to my buddy uh, Brian Bartell, who's a huge uh, Giants fan, and listens to this show. I can't stand the Giants because they beat my Patriots in two Super Bowls in a row, thanks to Eli Manning, who I now actually think is actually a pretty, pretty good announcer. I watch him all the time now. Then Parcells became the head football coach for the New England Patriots in 1993, took him to a Super Bowl again, an abysmal team when I was a season ticket holder in 91, 92, and then he turned them around, got into the Super Bowl, didn't win. So what are the common characteristics here? And he also did this in 1997 with the New York Jets, where he took a 1-15 in team, and two years later, they were the conference champions. So like this guy has three cases where he took like the worst performing teams and turned them around. What are the things that he did? And that's why I find this article fascinating because – a lot of the stuff that you read in management and leadership articles, custom, I find is just too high minded and it's like philosophical. He's very just direct. And he says, there's three things that he did that have been consistent. And now he espouses this as sort of upper management and consulting for coaches to turn around teams. So does, does that set the frame sort of for where we're at right now? And I, I don't want people to say like, oh, I have a failing business. This is going to be the solution. But if you feel you might have an underperforming team, maybe in the digital marketing realm, you're a CMO, you're a digital, you know, digital marketing chief of your organization. You've got a team that's maybe listening to this show and trying to implement these things to get to that next level of scale. This is something that you need to understand in addition to all the things that we talk about on the show. Yeah. I, so one comment that I'll make, and it's a lesson I learned the hard way, is I try to only take advice from people that have actually done the thing. And you think to yourself like, oh, well, of course, that's obvious. Well, it's not always. Go look at the people that write on leadership and then see how often they've actually led anything. Right. Some of these fools and massive names, Ralph, you know, great big TED Talks, keynotes, best-selling books, 10 million copies sold, fool hasn't led a tour bus. Yeah. And so I really like when you're like, oh, no, here's, you know, Jocko Willink. Yeah. Maybe not the most eloquent leader in the world, but God bless, just the best advice you're ever going to get in your entire life because he actually did it and he did it in a high-stakes situation. And then you take these highbrow academics 
that, you know, it's all made up. It's all theory. So I, I love learning from guys like this because guys and gals, because you, you're, you're like, okay, you actually did the job. You did the job and you're not, now you're going to tell me how you did it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a YouTube series I'm watching right now. Uh, I, I just love, I love the leadership management psychology of like how stuff happens. And there's another YouTube series. We'll leave a link in the show notes for this as well, but um, not to go on to that. But a great example of this is it's called the men who built America, which my wife hates the title. She's like, how about the women who built America? I'm like, well, you know, this starts kind of back in like the civil war and, you know, Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and Vanderbilt and like kind of goes forward, Henry Ford, all this other sort of stuff. And some of the people that they have come on that are modern day examples of entrepreneurship are just CEOs of companies and never started a damn thing in there. Mm. But, and it pisses me off. It's like Carly Fiorino. Why am I getting entrepreneurial advice from her? She was a corporate stooge. You know, she didn't yeah. start HP. She was the CEO. And then there was like the CEO of Time Warner. But then you have guys like Steve Case, who was the AOL, you know, and, you know, he was like, he started AOL, which basically the, the reason why we have widespread internet today is because of those, remember those discs everybody got? I do. Like you AOL? walk into Walmart, you get 20,000 hours. Yeah. And then if you're real smart, because your mom would put on the safety, whatever precautions, you'd yeah. use AOL to go now and download net zero. And then you had unlimited <laughs> access. To that's right. Net zero. I remember that. Yeah. So that's an, that's an example of people who are actually doing it. And I love advice from people who have done it. Uh, Parcells is a great example here. It's a sports example. It's very, this is, this is rough. I wouldn't say it's rough advice. I would say it's unrefined and I, it's very direct. It's very direct. And I, the, the reason I like it is because it is so direct. I think you have to adapt what we're going to talk about here to your own style and don't do it the way that Parcells does it, but take away the mindset more than anything because he's actually done it and reached a level of success in the sporting world. Granted, it's different than the digital marketing world, but there's a lot of a lot of similarities here because you're you're ultimately if you're leading a team of media buyers or creative or whoever it happens to be, maybe you're an agency owner, you are leading a team to success, to victories mm. at the end of the day. And you that's hope. what that's what you want. And if you're not getting the victories, I think, you know, these, some of these pieces of advice here, I think are very applicable. So the first thing that he talks about is when he first became the coach of the Giants in, let's see, I think it was 90, early 90s, I believe, late, eight, actually late 80s, sorry. Uh, one of the things was, is that he in, inherited a team with a lot of big personalities, okay, some big stars. You know, Lawrence Taylor was on that team, Harry Carson, like some big names who ended up being total studs a little bit later on under his guidance. And he was a bit intimidated. And so when he took over the team, he didn't really take charge and he ended up almost getting fired his first year. So he no realized, way. all right, the second year, all right, I realize I'm on the chopping block. I'm just going to do it my way. So he started to sort of change his tone. And I think this is an important thing. And this is something that we refer to as radical candor is one of our core values from tier 11. I would highly recommend that you think about like how you want to do this is that especially in a virtual environment, it's really important to tell people, uh, you know, exactly what's on your mind and not soft soap it. So what he says mm -hmm. is on the first day of training camp, I laid it on the line. I told everybody that losing would no longer be tolerated. Players who were contributing to the team's weak performance would be given a chance to change and if they didn't change, they'd be gone. Modern day example of this is, I don't know if you follow college football all that much, but Deion Sanders right now is like the thing, even though he's lost two games in a row as of this recording. He's basically, he came into the Colorado uh, football program. They were 1-11 last year. Turned them around. They were 3-0 and to start. Now they're 3-2. and But he came in and basically did the same thing. He's like, listen. If you're not up to this standard, you will be let go. Now, this is harder to do in the corporate world when we have employees and we have employee rights and all these other sorts of things. But the point is, is that his number one message here is don't wait to earn their leadership. Just 
impose your leadership upon everyone. And in, in very, very simple terms, tell them that you're in charge. And this is what he did in his second year. And it was a tough message. I mean, he says, I told them what I think a team is all about and all that team, the, the highest form of uh, you know, success in the context of a team sport is achievement. And they could probably make a lot of money in football and buy tons of nice things, doing all these sorts of things. But the only permanent value of work lies in achievement. And that mm. comes from relentless effort and it comes from commitment to the cause. So underscoring what the vision is here, he came in and said, all right, here's where we're going. We are not here to finish fourth. We are here to win the NFC East. That is our goal. That is our singular goal. And as a result of that, I am going to lead you in that direction. And everything that I do and that you do should be aligned in order to achieve that goal. And I think that is the mark of a leader. I think a lot of leaders don't necessarily put a stake in the ground and say, here's where we are, here's where we're going to go. And unfortunately, that also means if you're not on board with this, that's fine. We can find you another place where you might thrive in a better environment. On somebody else's team. On somebody else's team, which is okay because this goes back to another great book, which we refer to a lot uh, you know, inside our internal meetings, which is Good to Create by Jim Collins. It's getting the right people on the bus, in the right seats on the bus. Can I ask you a question about the good to create? Yeah. I'm not trying to be overly competitive, but I, I, this is relevant to the conversation, I hope. Have you noticed that all the a, companies... I have a feeling I know what the question is, by the way. Go ahead. The companies that Jim Collins references in Good to Great, I think without yep. a single exception, all suck now. Yep. Like if you go back and read Good to Great and you... Like it didn't age well. So... Right. That is part of the message of the book mm. is because they lost that direction. They lost... Now, they were mediocre, then became great, and then a lot of them became mediocre after that. It's because they yeah. lost what made them great. And even though Walmart is, an is not an example there, they definitely lost their way. Um, Nucor Steel, which is one of the companies that actually is there, is still great. Fannie Mae, another example, they lost that greatness. There's a lot of examples, but he's not talking about like built to last, which is an ever – like a great company forever and ever. Like they were yeah. great. Like what it's was funny, the event? because all the companies in Built to Last suck now too. That's true. The point is, is like at a certain point in time, they were great. And what right. inside the black box he looks into and says, there? what brought them there? And then in his postscript, he actually has a second book that talks about this. He says, that's where they lost it. They forgot all the principles that got them to greatness and they couldn't sustain mm. it. And it was either. I didn't know that postscript exists. That makes me a little softer on him for at least acknowledging that. Good on Collins. So think about that as like a, a slice of time. And in that time, they went from fairly mediocre to great. And it wasn't necessarily market forces that did it. It was because of the principles in that book, which I mm -hmm. think are still relevant to this day question is, is when you lose like your leader, a lot of cases they lost like a level five leader and that level five leader handed it off to somebody who was mediocre and they lost their way. So we could go into a lot of detail there, but anyway, that's a big question. A lot of people have when they talk about good to great, because I think it is still the principles in the book are really solid. And I think they do back up a lot of what we're discussing here. They also, there's a point in a company where you become so big, all of a sudden you become so bureaucratic. And then yeah. you rely on systems and processes to manage people as opposed to hiring the right people, which is a big part of this whole article here is finding the right types of people, depending on, you know, what your culture is and that, that right person is different for every business. But when you have somebody who can't compete in today's environment that maybe could a year or so ago, and we've had this happen inside tier 11 where we've let people go because they just couldn't continue to strive and stay you know stay competitive in this world in which we exist right now which is hyper competitive and as a result of that they're elsewhere 
they're probably at other agencies or in some cases, maybe they moved on and started their own business, which is, which is perfectly fine. So <laughs> we have a mutual friend who says we, we release them to the market. <laughs> Which is the nicest way of saying that. We do. Another thing, like, not that this is part of the conversation, but Bill Parcells, in, he, he says this sort of in the last part of it, is that um, when you're picking the right people, it's, it's vital. And, it, it, you know, and in the NFL, you now have to rework your team almost like 30% of your staff every single year because of free agency mm-hmm. You know, think about college imagine football. Imagine how hard that would be, dude. I mean, I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine. Like, you're, every year, like, new people are coming in. You have to retrain them. Like, this is just how professional sports are. That's why I always sort of thought, like, college athletics are really hard. It's like you get a new team, basically an entirely new team every three to four years, which is crazy. So, but he does talk about that, and that turnover does definitely does add a wrinkle to it and uh you know refers to w- one of the players that he admired through the years through other uh that were uh, playing for another team and ended up recruiting him this guy brian cox and ended up becoming a real stud for him uh you know for the new england patriots and then uh, obviously for uh for the jets so point is is i think you've got to hold true to that right person right seat i know you've got a really good hiring process we have i think the most kick-ass hiring process uh, on the planet. A lot of agencies think they're great at hiring. Make it even better in some way, shape, or form. You know, sharpen that saw to the point where you're only accepting the best of the best. And well, can I say some along those lines? And everybody's going to hate me for this. If you want the best, you got to pay them like they're the best. Yep. So many agencies are trying to get peak performers but then they want to squeeze down on the salary and just you know they want to get the most for the least and i'm like man that is so short-sighted and i'm saying this as a guy i can't afford the peak performers stateside you know like a a peak performer media buyer stateside i don't know what those guys make 150 grand a year to start like who knows i don't know uh that's why i go offshore so go to where you can pay the most and pay the best but yeah if you want the best of the best i think you have to pay like that and that's such an inconvenient conversation. Anytime I bring this up to business owners and entrepreneurs, like they cannot get away from this discussion fast enough. Mm-hmm. But I just, it, you know, and it's not just about the money. You're talking about people who need to win. It's how they keep score. So yeah. it's not that they're being greedy. It's that y- you actually need to satiate this bloodlust they have and to know that they're at the top. Yeah, I think there's ways to arbitrage the workforce in – a virtual environment and there's pockets of, you know, highly, you know, uh, I was going to say articulate, that's not necessarily the word, but incredible talent and hunger in other countries that are outside of the U S and we found some of those Or even moving where you are in the States, right? Like don't go to necessarily Manhattan or San Francisco. What if it's in Kansas? For sure. And I read this interesting article the other day. They did a study and found that people are willing to pay, take a 30% pay cut if they can have uh, flexibility in terms of time and location. Uh, and 30% was the average. That's mm-hmm. not even the peak. Like 30% on average if they have time and location flexibility. So you don't have to pay the most, period, full stop. You have to pay the most within the confines of all the other value that you can provide. Yeah. And then you, and then you find yourself peak performers. <clears throat> People are willing to take less. Like we've done a fair amount of recruiting the last couple of months, especially in really high value positions like our sales position, our CSO positions. And we haven't necessarily gone after or attracted the people that are just looking to make a switch because they're going to make more money. What they're what we've found is that they are buying into the idea of what they're being a part of. And I think that does go back to the Parcells article is that in, you know, if you're imposing your leadership, you have to have a higher vision that people buy into. And like for us is very, very specific. And we bring this through on every part of our interviewing process. And we also weed out for our five core values. So it's like, Hey, you're going to be a part of this. If you have these things, you're going to be like-minded individuals and we're all working towards this goal 
here, which is a worthwhile goal. And this is what that thing is. I think you as a leader have to have that in order to be able to attract and to be able to lead. And he doesn't really talk about that in this article here. You have to have a higher vision, not all the time, like talking vision, 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 but it's got to be in everything. It's got to be sort of throughout the organization. And that's what attracts the right types of people for your business. The right type of person isn't necessarily the right type of person for every business. It's the right type of person for your business. You have to get very, very Mm -hmm. clear on what that looks like. The hack that I will tell you, and I know we're, laboring this point a bit is if you have a star employee that you say if you do it, let's say you've got 20 people on your staff and like the two, there's two people you're like, man, I wish I could clone them. I wish I could just like, it's John Moran for you. You know, I wish I could find like five John Morans. Like, I don't think they exist. Oh, dude, I'd be a billionaire. I don't think they I'd exist. Be a billionaire tomorrow. You would be a billionaire. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, is like, if you could find John, five John Morans, so then list out all the characteristics of that person, because that's the right person for your business. And for us, we did it. We actually still have that person on staff. It was three main characteristics with some subtext. And we went and hired that person, found that person, attracted that person. And that's what created our culture. Mm. So it's a really important thing to do. Whether you have a staff of two or you have a staff of 200, it's important to go through that exercise because otherwise, you know, in the good to great example, they forgot that. It's one of the things that Collins talks about. It's like they just lost it. And they're like, ah, we'll just take whoever and we'll impose SOPs and procedures and it'll become super bureaucratic. And then just the performance just kind of goes down and down and down. So uh, first step is don't wait to earn your leadership. uh, Impose it according to Parcells in this article. And you can you can do this however you want to do it. You don't have to do it in his way. But I think it's very important to have that as a as a basic tenet of leading people to success, especially if it's coming to this digital marketing stuff, which is constantly evolving. The second point is the power of confrontation. Kasim, are you are you comfortable with with confrontation? Depends on with who and for what reason. Well, what he says is that in the clearest possible terms is you need to tell people what they're doing wrong. And if they don't want to listen, they don't belong. (laughs) But we refer to this as radical candor. This is Mm -hmm. if somebody does something right, tell them immediately. If somebody does something wrong, tell them immediately, but do it in private. Which is usually how we do it. Now, the way that Parcells does it is he says, you know, he does this, and I think this is really important, is have frank one-on-one conversations with your people. If you don't have one-on-one conversations with people that you're reporting to, and he did this with a 53-man roster. If you actually watch sort of his, you know, um, any of the documentaries on him, he just goes around at individual conversations, invites them into his office, talks to them one-on-one, tells them frankly, you know, one of the best lines that he uses when he talks about confrontation is, I don't think you are performing as well as you think that you can. And I think it's a very, very powerful line. I'll get the exact phrase that he says is that this ends up self-motivating people without really having to motivate them. I think you're better than you think you are, or I don't think you're performing up to your potential. You can do better. And it's a fascinating and a brilliant way. And I do this for my kids all the time. Uh, And I do it for us, our staff. It's like, that's great, but you can do better. I expect more from you. And what it does is it subtly tells them what they're giving you isn't enough, but you also think highly of them that they are, there's this gap in where they're performing and where they can perform. So the gap is down here and where you think they can is up here. Now, whether or not you're making it up in your head, this is, this could be, you know, 
leadership manipulation, but it's a very effective strategy, especially in a high performance culture like a football team. If you relate that back to a digital marketing team, you know, what, what we really try to reward is obviously radical candor, which is the first part of what we talked about here, but also initiative. Initiative is doing things without being asked, is doing things that make the team better, that not only enhance your performance, but also enhance the rest of the team. That's where we sort of see like that's somebody helping to achieve their potential. And because digital marketing and all the things that we do are so dynamic, don't you just love the media buyer comes up, I've got this great new way of doing this and I'm going to share it with the team. Isn't that like, doesn't that like give you like, chills it's like it's so great because you know like yeah, that's got a the kudos right channel in slack specifically for that if somebody comes in and does a knowledge share I, I, I played high school basketball and uh one of the things i thought the coach did phenomenally well was uh I, he rarely would reward high scorers but he'd always reward high assists yeah and i think that's you know continuing with our sports analogy that's probably about right Everybody wants to score, needs to score, is going to score. Great. Good for you. Pat on your back. But like the assist, man, that's a, that's a tough skill to cultivate. But when you cultivate it, you become the most valuable person on the team. Because now, you know, we've moved from football to basketball, but you just took yourself from being one entity that can score to five entities that can score um, or can position for a score. And, and if you apply that to business, like, goodness, uh, I'm thinking right now about the people on my team, the people that are good with the assist. You know, like Yvonne, my CTO, started out as my EA. He's the best on the assist. If you, I could do this right now. I would do a thought experiment where I just drop a random problem into Slack. He'll be the first one to be like, I'm on it. It's not even his problem, his job, his department. Just I'm on it. Love those people. Like that. I do too. That's the epitome of initiative. Yeah. For me, which is one of our five core values. It's like, those are the people you want. Like, so if you could have a team full of him, like they're out there. They really are like, it, you know, yeah. that's one, like not in the way that he does it exactly the way that he does. Everybody does it a little bit differently, which is makes us all interesting as humans, you know? But the point is, is that's a great example of what we're talking about here. And he also knows that when he does that, he's probably going to get positively reinforced. Somebody's going to say something to him and add a boy. Like we have a whole channel. I'm brutally on. mean to him. Yeah. I, I, no compliments. I just, yeah. <laughs> Well, nothing somebody, but like vitriol and hatred. Somebody's <laughs> nice to him. I know. Yeah. It's funny, man. He's become one of my best friends. You know, it's weird how that happens. Yeah. It does evolve. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. So one of his other lines is, and this is another one. It's, it's, it's in your best interest that we succeed. It's in my best interest that you succeed. We actually really want the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, when I'm hiring folks, I say, listen, like if what tier 11 offers you is in alignment with what you want, it's, if it's perfectly in alignment, we have a match here because what you want is the same thing that we want. We want the same thing. So we're united in that goal of getting the company obviously to that next level of success and success for our customers equals helping them achieve their vision. But in so doing, it helps you achieve your professional goals and your personal goals. Like that's nirvana in the working world. I said, you know, when whenever we interview something, like I'm the last person that does the interviews, and that is my line. Cause I have to find out like what is it that just makes you tick? Like what do you like what do you love doing? What could you do all day? Like what just lights you up about this industry? Tell me what it is. And then I what I try to do is align that with you can take that thing that you love, and if that overlaps perfectly with what we're trying to do here, this is a good match. And if they have all the other five core characteristics, ultimately that's going to be a successful working relationship. So uh, one of the things that uh, he does say, and I'll, I'll leave you on this, and the second uh, part of this uh, on confrontation is healthy, is that... Uh, and I've seen a lot of documentaries on Parcel. I, I just love Parcells, first off. He's funny, you know, even though he's a Jersey guy, you know, a Massachusetts guy, but you know, we did lose a Super I Bowl. I didn't know that that was an epic battle that little, was raging. A little thing there, although a lot of, really? I've, got, I've got a lot of friends in New Jersey, actually. Uh, 
he says one of the biggest things when players come back to him 10 years after their playing career, they say the one thing that they remember most about him is this, that one line is when he said, I think you're better than you think you are. And they say that motivated me more than anything else. And they thank him for that. I think as a manager, that's a pretty powerful statement. If you don't think that about your people, if you literally think like you're lying to your people and saying that, you probably have the wrong person on the bus. Mm. So there is that. Isn't that too. interesting? Yeah. I guess that means that nobody reaches their potential without some motivation, without some encouragement. I think everybody, yeah. I do think, I don't think that's, I don't think it's, uh, they say the best people don't need to be led, managed, or motivated, but best people need to be pushed. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen that. I think it's an archetypal truth, dude. Like, you know, uh, Luke needed Obi-Wan, mm -hmm. right? Rocky needed that weird old man in the corner. What was his name? Uh, uh, Nick. No. Yeah. Was that it? Yeah. Adrian. Like, you no, can't just... Nick. No, yeah. I think Nick is right. But you couldn't have Rocky just wake up and be like, I'm going to get in shape now. You know, he needed... You need that just... What would you call it? It's almost guide. paternal in nature. Guide. Yeah, you need the guide. You need a guide. You need a guide. I always used to say that like when I ran the regional sales division for this big, fat corporate 500, S&P 500 company is that spend the most time with your best people because they're the ones, no, 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 no. I'm going to spend all the time with my worst performer. So that's the worst thing you can do. Mm. Like you need to figure out a way to, if they're your worst performers, like what is it? Is it a training issue or, or is it a them issue? You need to ask yourself that question, but spend most of the time with your best people because they're the ones you want to model success and see what they're doing so that you yeah. can teach others first off. But secondly, it's like, they're the ones who need a coach. Like, even though Tiger Woods isn't at the top of golf all the time, the big expression way back in the nineties was, Hey, even Tiger Woods as a swing coach. Like even, you know, Albert Pujols, who won like eight MVPs, had a hitting coach, you know, uh, you know, name any great performer like Aaron Rodgers has a quarterback's coach. Like so did mm -hmm. Tom Brady. The point is, is like everybody needs a coach and at the higher level, it's a tiny, tiny little incremental differences. I have a coach. I have a business coach. You have a coach. You have mentors. Do you have people that help you at a higher level get to that next level? So do you need it as motivation? No. Does it help you get to the next level of performance when you have that kind of input from an individual? And Parcells does this extremely well. Yes. He was coaching probably the greatest linebacker of all time. Lawrence Taylor uh, was not Willie McGinnis. Sorry, Patriots fans. But Lawrence Taylor and even Lawrence Taylor needed motivation. And that's what Parcells did. It's like, oh, you got 14 sacks. Oh, you missed that one, you know, on uh, the Seattle game back in October because you did, you know, the swim move and you should have gone on the inside. You went to the outside and it's like, ah, you know, like that's how you would do it because, because LT was just this super competitive guy. So yes, everybody needs it. Um, do they get it? A lot of times. No, but I do think that's the difference between, you know, a, a high level performance and a superior level of performance when it comes to your team. And when it comes to us. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's worthy of mentioning here because a lot of the people we're talking to are, they're not necessarily at the top. You know, I sold my agency. I'm no longer at the top. I'm in the middle. And so what I, what we're talking about me dispelling should also be the thing that I expect. And, and maybe even ask for, you know, it's like, hey, I need some radical candor yeah. for my own improvement opportunities. What yeah. can I do better? Well, I mean, you're going to be entering a new stage of, of your career, right? Like, like you're already starting to sort of lay the groundwork for that. I mean, it's going to be in this space. It's like you need now you need you've gotten you've checked that box of, hey, I've sold my agency. That's a pretty big box to check. Not many people get to that point. Not many people get to build a multi-million dollar company. You know, it's like what less than 
one half of 1% get to 5 million and then 10 million, it's like 0.001%. I forget what the percentages are. It's a very, very small portion. And then to sell it, like you're in rarefied air. So what's that next step? Is it going to be like a Greg Smith is going to get you to the next stage or another type of mentor? I know you're part of all these groups, but it's like every stage you need somebody to push you to that next level. Mm. You know, or maybe it's going to be me. Maybe I could just be your mentor. There we go. Yeah. And all you'll take is 10%. I bet. All I'll take is 15%. We can negotiate that. <laughs> all right. So the last That's rule the here from this article, once again, we're referring to an article, the tough work of turning around a team uh, by Harvard Business Review and, and uh, Bill Parcells is the final step is after confrontation is healthy, which was number two, which we just talked about is success breeds success. And I think this is a really important one as well. And I, I like the fact that there's only really three tips here, which makes it super digestible in a lot of ways. Yeah, this is not a simple. 17 thing list, like just focus on these big things, trying to distill down what, what helps turn around underperforming teams, or in your case, maybe your team is just doing good and you want them to get to that next stage of growth is as much as you are in cognizant and having a uh, radical candor type of conversations or, or healthy confrontation discussions about their weaknesses, it's just as important, if not more important to always build a culture of success which means layering on little victories, small wins. So he talks about, uh, you know, how to win games. How do you turn around a one in 15 team into a team that actually wins a conference championship? Well, you do it by small steps. It's not all one big, you know, uh, motivational speech. It's not one fell swoop. It's all these tiny little things. And one of the things that he talks about is you need to believe as a team that you have the ability to win games and you have to believe in the ability to win, which is a, is a first big step. And you do that by, for example, in training camp. And this is, you know, use your own example of like how you can apply this in your business. You know, we don't focus, he says, I, we don't focus on the ultimate goal, which is winning the Super Bowl. We, we establish goals that are within immediate reach. Okay. Yeah, incremental. So small gains, like we're going to be a smart team. We're not going to take unnecessary penalties. We're not going to do offsides. We're not going to have encroachment. We're not going to, you know, have any of these sort of smaller like penalties that just are little nicks. We're not going to throw the ball away. We're not going to fumble. We're going to be a smart team. We're going to, Make sure we manage the clock well, like all these things. Like that's the first step. We're going to become a smart team first. Then we're going to be a well-conditioned team. All right. So we're going to do lots of cardio. We're going to run up this hill that they run up, you know, in Patriots practice, which is like awful, I guess. And like, you know, they just do that at the end of practice. Um, we're going to be a team that plays hard, like put in the effort. And to your point, it's the coach that rewards the assist, not the players who actually score. And for me, it's all about, I don't necessarily care what the result is. Like for example, like my son is a baseball player. I don't compliment him on, him on going three for five. I compliment him on smart at bats. I compliment him maybe on the two walks that he took, or maybe, you know, the two pitches that he took for strikes to set up the three, two pitch. Cause I know that that's where he's does his best work when he's in a three and two count. I compliment those things, the effort, the journey, not the result, because the result is variable, especially in baseball. It's like once you connect with the ball, and we're mixing our metaphors again, you don't know where it's going to go. Once your quarterback Ruth, throws yeah. a pass, like it could get tipped, you know, then you don't exactly know where it's going to go. But it's like, did you set up correctly? Did you call the right play? Did you read the defense well? Did you think as a situational quarterback? Like all these things, like fill in the blanks what it is in digital marketing. Talk about those things because those things are the small steps that lead towards the big goal. And this is what he talks about in this article in a very, very clear term. So 
you know, plays hard. We're going to be a team that has pride. We're going to be a team that wants to win collectively. We're going to be a team that, you know, doesn't criticize each other. And so you do compliment like, Hey, today was a great practice, you know, and this is what we did really, really well. This is what we're going to work on tomorrow. And every day it's like reinforce the things that people do well, and then say, these are the things we're going to work on tomorrow. We're going to get better at. And so you get a little bit better by increments every single day. So quote that he uses, we got something done today. We executed real well. I'm really pleased with your work. Here's what I want you to do tomorrow. So you did this well today. Here's what we're doing tomorrow. Don't rest on your laurels. We're always moving forward. I want to see flawless special teams work. If you accomplish that, then we'll be ready for the game on Sunday. Not to win the game on Sunday, but we're going to be ready for the game on Sunday. So the point is, is like every little step along the way, especially if you have an underperforming team, like all these tiny little incremental improvements that you can leverage with your team start to add up to the big wins. The small wins eventually equal the big wins. So confrontation is healthy, but also set small goals and hit them. And I, these are really the three core concepts for, from this entire article. And obviously we'll leave links in the show notes here. And then the bottom line is we talked about this throughout is having the right types of people on staff. But if you think about, you know, where you can apply this today, tomorrow, and how this can make you become a better leader, better marketing executive, better agency owner, like these are the things I find that lead to better performance. And this show is all about like performance and digital marketing, right? But it's a human endeavor. And if you can get more performance or squeeze more performance, bring the best out of everyone using some of these tactics and also some of the things that you learn on the show here, you will achieve a level of success. So thoughts, comments, concerns, custom. Confessions. Confessions. No, I think it's just, it's a worthy read. It's not long, which uh, sort of speaks to, I, I think the, the brilliance is in the brevity in a lot of ways. Like you said, it's only three tips. But if you're listening to this um, and this resonated, I'd go check out the article because there's a lot of little nuggets in here that uh, just resonate. They resonate a lot. And uh, it's the perfect metaphor. You know, people always say that sports uh, metaphors are exclusionary because they, uh, alienate people who don't like sports. The problem with that is it's just, they're just so aligned. They you know, are. It's this, this business is so much like a game in this, in this very specific way too. So um, I think this is awesome. And I appreciate you sharing this with me. Yeah. So like, I love it because it is brief and it's, it crystallizes a lot uh, in a very short period of time. And we'll leave some links in the show notes too. There's, there's, you know, if you want to read more about this guy, Parcells, and just analogies in sports and football in particular, we'll leave some links in the show notes on that. Uh, there's a series on, on NFL Network called America's Game, which I absolutely love. It takes like all the big stars and the coaches and sort of breaks down their, you know, how they became who they are and what path that led them to that way. And there's one on Parcells, which is outstanding. Uh, so if you want a little bit more on that, we'll leave some links in the show notes there. Uh, of course, let us know what you think. This is a bit of a departure today. Awesome. It's, it's not all about digital marketing sometimes. Sometimes it's about the mindset. Uh, and we did a, it we, applies. Yeah, it, it absolutely applies. So uh, let us know. Subscribe. Leave a rating wherever you're listing. We're... Uh, Probably a little bit behind on doing our shout outs for ratings. We'll do that on next show. Kasim. <laughs> but uh, obviously let us know what we can do better over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better. I would actually leave a rating wherever you, because those come directly to us for right now. Sir, sure, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better is absolutely important, but leave us a rating. We'll certainly read that out on the air for you. Give you a little, uh, little props for your business. If you want that as well, follow Perpetual Traffic and myself on all our socials, me especially on LinkedIn, Kasim, everywhere, on every social, known to mankind, at Kasim Hazalam. And uh, go back and listen to previous episodes. We'll leave links there. And of course, check us out on our YouTube channel at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. 
All resources and show notes will be at perpetualtraffic.com. On behalf of my awesome co-host, Kasim Aslam. Peace. Peace. Until next show, see ya.